Come on, let's put our hands together for Jesus this morning. Lord, we love you and we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Are you happy? I said, are you happy? I'm starting to wonder if I came to the right session. I, to I was told there would be evangelists here. I tell you, any, any evangelist that can watch a video like that and their blood doesn't begin to boil, they need some defibrillator paddles to come and revive them from the dead. I tell you, we are living in the greatest days of harvest in the history of the world. These are the days of the great harvest. Can you say amen? amen. I really hope this morning and this afternoon, I'm sorry I'm jet lagged, I keep saying this morning, I realize it's this afternoon, but I really believe that God is going to touch many of your hearts and inspire you with fresh vision and renew and refresh your spirit uh, it's for this next season that's to come. Because how many of you know we need the evangelists for this harvest that is about to come in, in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. Um, this is what's gonna happen over the next few moments. Uh, I'm actually here with evangelist Willie Crew, and we are both gonna be speaking to you this morning. I'm gonna talk to you for a few minutes, and then he is going to speak to you as well. Afterwards, we're going to take questions from, from you and do our best to answer those, and I believe that you're gonna be blessed. Uh, I really am hoping that God will, will touch many of your hearts with some fresh vision because just here in the Empowered 21 Conference, we have been meeting with evangelists. We've had our very first uh, Congress of Global Evangelists. It's called the, the Global Evangelism Alliance. And we've met this week and we're just filled with excitement about what God is going to do in the days and weeks to come. And I, I think you're going to get a little glimpse of that this afternoon. Let me begin this morning just by reading to you a passage from the book of Matthew chapter 13. I think this will set the tone for what I want to share with you today. Matthew chapter 13 and verse uh, 17. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And this is what he says. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things that you see, but they did not see them. And they have desired to hear the things that you hear, but they have not heard them. Verse 16, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and blessed are your ears, for they hear. Come on, just turn to the person next to you and say, you're blessed. You're a blessed person. Tell the other one on the other side, say, you're blessed too. Because of the things that you are seeing and hearing, because of the days that you are living in, because of the opportunities that God has extended to you, you are a blessed people. You know, those sights and those sounds that you just watched on that screen, those are historic moments that generations of prophets and righteous men have longed to experience, but they did not experience them. But you've got to see them here this afternoon. And I believe that the best is yet to come in Jesus' name. Africa will still be saved. All the way from Cape Town to Cairo. That was what Reiner Bonnke said all of those years. And we continue to say it, except now we say it a little bit differently. We don't say Africa shall be saved. We say Africa is being saved in Jesus' name. And Johannesburg is a part of Africa. How many of you know that? When I, whenever I come to South Africa, they always tell me they're going up to Africa. I have to remind them, you're part of Africa too. Johannesburg is Africa. Amen. And what God is doing on this continent is absolutely remarkable. Let me just share with you a little bit of my story. A lot of people want to know how it is that I came to work with Evangelist Bonke and how this whole thing transpired. It's actually quite an amazing story and one that's probably too long for me to tell uh, in its exhaustive version, in its unabridged version. But I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version here today. I'm actually the, the son of a, a preacher. Uh, my father is a pastor. My great-grandfather is a pastor. My great-great-grandfather was a pastor. Uh, I've grown up in the church all of my life. And I think that everyone just assumed that when, when I grew up, I would follow in my father's footsteps and I would also be a pastor. And uh, indeed, I did plant some churches and pastored for a while. But you know, somebody said, if you want to make an evangelist miserable, force him to preach to people that are already saved. And that's how I felt. I knew that God had called me to the nations. And so my heart was always stirring with this thing. Now, when I was 16 years old, the story is too long to tell, but God had actually spoken to me that I was going to work with Ron Harbonke before I knew who he was. And that, that um, actually came to a head when I was 18. I met Reinhard Bonnke on the beach 
in Pensacola, Florida, in a very strange series of events. I thought that would be the moment that he would invite me to come work with him and travel with him. Instead, he said goodbye. He went one direction, I went the other direction, and I didn't hear from him again for many years. And then when I had planted my very first church, um, I got a call from a friend. At that time, I, I was looking for a job to support my family. How many of you know church plants don't pay very well? And uh, mine was no exception to the rule. In fact, all the money that we got in the offerings went to meet the needs of the church. And I was willing to work at McDonald's or anywhere just to, just to put food on the table. And then I got a call from a friend that I had gone to Bible school with. And he said the ministry that he was working for was looking for somebody that had a degree in business, which I had. And they wanted them to come and work in the warehouse. And I said, well, what ministry is it? He said, it's Christ for All Nations, the ministry of Reinhard Bonnke. What had happened is that over those years, in between the time that I met Reinhardt in Pensacola and that time, Reinhardt's ministry had moved from, from uh, here, from South Africa to Germany and then to the United States and Sacramento, California, and then to Orlando, Florida, a very long journey for four major cities in three different countries. And um, I had moved from Pensacola to Tampa. I was living about 40 miles away from the office. And so I went in and I, I was interviewed for the job. I got the job. And if you could see a flow chart of the ministry, like the hierarchy of, of uh, position, I was on the very bottom. I actually had literally had the job on the very, very bottom. And that was, uh, that's how I started in the ministry of Christ for all nations. So I say that to all of you who are evangelists and even those of you who are in any other position, be faithful wherever God puts you. And as you're faithful, he'll give you more. Somebody said one time, they said, you know, if you're given a job of washing the toilets, which I had that job, by the way, if your job is washing the toilets, they said, they said wash it like it's, it's the, the toilet that the king is going to sit on. I said, no, I have something even better for you. I said, if you're called to wash toilets, wash the back side of the toilet as well as the front side of the toilet. Because when you wash the back side of the toilet, no human eyes see that. When you wash the back side of the toilet, you wash it for the only eyes that really matter. The eyes that really reward faithfulness. And those are the eyes of God. And so to make a long story short, Evangelist Bonke came to the office one day and he saw me sitting there working at a desk. He went to my supervisor and he said, ask that young man if he'd like to travel with me as an evangelist. And so my supervisor came, or I'm sorry, as an assistant, as an assistant. And so my supervisor came in, he said, would you like to travel with Reinhard Bonnke as an assistant? And I said, well, let me pray about it, yes. <laughs> and so um, I began traveling with him around the world and I, it was not a ministry job, I was not preaching. I was carrying his bags, I was polishing shoes, I was doing very menial tasks, but I was thrilled to be doing it because I saw that as a contribution to the work of evangelism in the world. And I never had any designs for anything more. I wasn't there to you know, get Reinhard Bonnke's microphone. I, I didn't ever think that I would take over Reinhard Bonnke's ministry. Honestly, I was there to serve him and I was thankful that God had given me that privilege. And the very first time that I had the opportunity to go to a crusade with Evangelist Bonnke, it was in the nation of Nigeria. Are there any Nigerians here this afternoon? Just checking, I always like to see if Nigerians all around. We've had some amazing experiences in Nigeria. And we went to this place called Ogoja. Now, most of you have probably never heard of Ogoja. That's okay. I've never heard of it either. You know, I always say that it, it's wrong to say that any place is the middle of nowhere because to the people that live in that place, it's not nowhere, it's home. But if there is such a place as the middle of nowhere, I found it. And it's Ogoja, Nigeria. I remember we flew into Lagos, that main port city there, and then we flew to Abuja the capital and then we began to drive hour after hour after hour just into the into the wilderness and I didn't even know we had arrived after about 10 hours of driving I didn't even know we had arrived in a in a village but there were some elders standing on the side of the road and they were there to greet us as we pulled into town we got out of the cars they began to greet Evangelist Bonke remember I was an assistant at the time they didn't care about me they were greeting Evangelist Bonke and they said thank you for coming to our town they said, many other evangelists, even other African evangelists don't come here because this is a remote place and the population is very small. And then they began to apologize. They said, we've heard of your great crusades in other places in the world. And they said, we have to tell you this will not be one of those great crusades because even if everyone in the whole region came, 
Everyone, if there was 100% of the population in the whole region that came to this crusade, they said, maybe you would have 100,000 people, but never more than that. Now, I grew up in a church with about 60 members, so 100,000 people didn't sound too bad to me. But um, to my surprise on the first night, as it began, there was actually for CFAN, for our crusades, it was a very small crowd. I think it was about 30,000 that showed up on that first night. And um, some of the team members were a little bit disappointed. I was less disappointed because I didn't know what to expect anyways. And uh, Evangelist Bonke began to preach. And I remember, you know, I grew up in the church. I'm a, I told you I'm a pastor's kid. So I've heard the gospel literally since I was old enough to understand words. And yet I, I told Evangelist Bonke at the end, I felt like I heard the gospel tonight for the first time. It was so clear, it was so powerful, and it was so wonderful. I, I found my own heart stirred. I wanted to run to the altar and get saved all over again. And then he began to pray for the sick, and I saw people jumping out of wheelchairs, and blind eyes were opening, and deaf ears were opening, amazing miracles. And you know what happens when a man who has never walked suddenly receives uh, his ability to, to walk and he goes back to his village walking and the people that have known him his whole life see him walking and they find out that Jesus healed him you know what happens the next night the whole village shows up at the crusade and this is how our crusades grow because as Jesus does miracles somebody said miracles are the dinner bell of the gospel and I think that's true and so we saw those crowds double and sometimes triple from one night to the next and the final night as we were driving up to the field, Evangelist Bonke was in the car there and he was sharing with me some old stories. You know, old men love to tell old stories. Isn't that true? And uh, sometimes when old men tell stories, they tell the same stories over and over again and you just have to pretend like you've never heard them before. But this time he was telling a story I'd never heard. And he said, you know, years ago we found in uh, a museum an unpublished journal of the pioneer missionary David Livingston. How many of you know who David Livingston was? Okay, well, everyone should know. But if you don't know, I'll tell you, David Livingston was one of the pioneer missionaries that came uh, with the gospel. He, he went on a couple of different missionary trips and it, it was very difficult in those early days because he was a, 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 a trailblazer, he was a pioneer. And it's always difficult when you're the first one to go into a territory. And so I, I had read in, in the history books that David Livingston said that on one of his missionary journeys, he had only been able to lead one person to Jesus. And he said, I'm not even sure about that one. And Evangelist Bonke said that in this unpublished journal that they discovered, Livingston had wrote there, he said, we see very, very little fruit for our work. He said, no one is interested in our message. He said, there is very little light on our path. But he said these words, many years from now, other missionaries will come and they will have more light than we have. And he said, when they preach, the lost will be saved in every service. And then he said these words, when that day comes, may they not forget us, the watchmen of the night. Isn't that beautiful? We pulled up to that crusade field and I got out of the car and walked up the steps. And you know, the way that the field is laid out many times, you don't really see the scope of the crowd until you get to a high vantage point. And so as I walked up to the top of that platform and I stood there, suddenly before me was a crowd that stretched literally to the horizon. When our count came back in that night, it was over 400,000 people had shown up to that meeting. Don't ask me where they came from. Don't ask me how they got there. I can tell you many of them have walked for days to be there. Many of them were sleeping right on the field in between crusade meetings. They didn't want to even leave. Amazing hunger in that place as Jesus was touching Agoja, Nigeria. And as I stood there on the, on the platform looking into the faces of these precious Nigerians, many of them with tears streaming down their faces, many who had, who had just gotten born again a few hours earlier, the day before, I remembered something that one of the local pastors told me. He said, here in West Africa, we have cemeteries dedicated to missionaries that came in other generations. And he said, if you'll go into those cemeteries, you may notice something peculiar. He said, on many of the tombstones, there are no names. There are only numbers. One will say five, one will say 
22, one will say 12, just random numbers. He said those numbers are the number of days that the missionary lived when he arrived on the African continent. He said it was so common in those days for those missionaries to die within days or weeks that even if they hadn't learned the name of the missionary, they would begin to count down the days. And if they didn't know the name, they would just write down the number of days that they lived on the tombstone. And it gripped my heart. I suddenly realized something. I had an epiphany. I realized that what we were witnessing was not the result of clever publicity stunts or marketing schemes. I realized that we were walking down a trail that had been forged by the blood and tears and sacrifice of generations of righteous men and women who longed to see what we were seeing and longed to hear what we were hearing and longed to live and experience what we were experiencing, but they didn't see it, they didn't hear it, they didn't experience it. I'm sure they dreamt about it. I'm sure they fasted for it. I'm sure they prayed for it. They gave their very lives for it, but they didn't see it in their day. And now we were living it. We were experiencing it. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to my heart so clearly, and this is what he said. You dare not fail now in the season of harvest. My brothers and sisters, we are living in the season of harvest right now. Leonard Ravenhill said the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. We are living right now not only in the opportunity of a lifetime, but in the opportunity of all of history. We have an opportunity to reap a great harvest for Jesus. And we dare not fail in this season of harvest. All of you who are evangelists, I speak to you as a fellow evangelist. It's time for us to get out there and to expend ourselves and be spent for the sake of this glorious gospel. Say amen. Amen. I want to read something to you. I was just struck with this as I was waiting to come up here. I read this recently and it touched my heart. The title of this is Missed Opportunity. One of the greatest disasters in the history of Christianity took place in 1271. Niccolo and Matteo Polo, the father and the uncle of Marco Polo, were visiting the Kublai Khan. At the time, Kublai Khan was a world ruler. He ruled all of China, all of India, and all of the East. Kublai Khan was attracted to the story of Christianity as Niccolo and Matteo told it to him. So he said this to them. You shall go to your high priest and tell him on my behalf to send me 100 men skilled in your religion and I will be baptized. And when I am baptized, my barons and great men will be baptized and their subjects will receive baptism too. And so there will be more Christians here than there are in your parts. So Niccolo and Matteo Polo went to the highest religious authority, the Pope, requesting 100 missionaries. The Pope responded, those barbarians don't deserve the gospel. Nothing was done for about 30 years. And then only two or three missionaries were sent. Too few and too late. As a result of this delay, Buddhist monks who were pleased to come converted the largest empire ever known to Buddhism. That generation had an opportunity. God had given it to them. And they missed it. And even today, millions of souls pay the price for their foolishness. My friend, we will not answer for the mistakes of former generations. And we won't be able to answer for the mistakes of future generations. But we will answer to God for what we have done with the opportunity that's been given to our generation. And I believe that the opportunity given to us is the greatest opportunity in history. This is why we go as a ministry. People ask me all the time, why do you push so hard? Why do you pay such a high price? I have a family, I have five children and a beautiful wife at home. I go many times three weeks out of the month, I'm traveling on the road, preaching the gospel in in dangerous places, in difficult places, in uncomfortable places, in remote places, spending hours and hours and hours on airplanes and always with a stomach that's upset from food that, that, that wasn't clean and all kinds of things. People say, why do you do it? I don't do it for money. I'm not a rich man. I don't do it for a reputation. I don't do it for a ministry. I'll tell you why I do it. That the lamb who was slain might receive the reward of his sufferings. And that the love that he has for people might reach their hearts. 
Can you say amen? amen? I have so many more things that I want to share with you, but I want to be sensitive to your time. But I hope that you can feel this burning passion in my heart. This, this is the time. This is the moment. These are the days. Keep this in your mind, what Jesus said to his disciples. Many prophets and righteous men have longed to see what you see. The next time you get depressed, the next time you begin to talk about how difficult Johannesburg is, how difficult South Africa is, how difficult whatever nation you come from is. You know, I hear this wherever I go in the world. I'll go there for a, a gospel crusade and the pastors will meet me at the airport. And they say the same thing to me every time. And I, I, I heard this phrase so many times I began to wonder who was whispering it in each pastor's ear. I'll leave you to decide who it might have been. And this is what they told me every time, almost the exact same words. They said, this city, you fill in the blank, is the graveyard of ministries. They said, we are a difficult city. This isn't like wherever else you came from. And usually, by the way, they say it's not like Africa. But then I heard Africans say it's not like America. So the, the devil in America is the devil in Africa. It's the same devil. He talks to us all the same. We need to tell him to get behind us. Amen. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Because see, if he can convince you that it can't be done, then you'll sit in your seat wishing that you lived in another place or in another time. And then you know what happens is God brings some crazy, foolish evangelist along who just didn't know any better. Maybe he didn't spend as much time in Bible school, so he doesn't know that it can't be done. He never heard that this was the graveyard of missionaries. And he shows up and he preaches the gospel and he casts out devils and he heals the sick and he does everything they told him could not be done. And then people sit back and they say, how was it done? How was it possible? It's because we didn't know that it was impossible. We didn't accept it. We didn't believe it. I'm gonna talk to you in a moment about the Global Evangelism Alliance that started here this week. One of the evangelists that came for that is a friend of mine. He is, he's ministering in Germany. And of course, Germany is one of those places that they told me is very difficult. So this friend of mine had a burden for Germany. He called me, he said, the Lord spoke to him. He's supposed to take the stadium where Hitler used to have his political rallies. Seats about 30,000 people. He wants to take that stadium and have preaching of the gospel for three days. And then he wants to send thousands of young people out into the streets to pray for the sick and to preach the gospel. This, this guy, I've known him for years. He'd never organized a crusade before. And I knew that. I said, who's helping you to organize this? He said, nobody. We're going to do it ourselves." I said, okay. Now listen. I know something about organizing events. Right now, our ministry is organizing 20 some, probably 25, 26 major events in different parts of the world. So I know how it works. I know how budgets work. I know how timelines work. I know how benchmarks and deadlines work. I know how committees work. All of these things. And I, I wanted to test him to see if he knew what he was talking about. So I said, well, how much money do you have? He said, none, we don't have any money. We're going to trust Jesus. I said, okay. I said, how much time do you have? He said, six months. We're going to do it in six months. I said, how many churches are on board? None are on board yet. And in my heart, I thought, this is going to be a disaster. He has no idea what he's talking about. But he was my friend. And for his sake, I said, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll come. He invited me. He said, will you come? Will you stand with us? Will you preach? I said, sure, I'll come but I already knew in my heart I was gonna be preaching in a stadium to 200 people. I went there knowing that it would be a disaster, never expecting what I encountered. When I walked into that stadium, it was packed from the floor to the ceiling. 30,000 people packed in that stadium, heaving with energy. Thousands and thousands and thousands of young people. They went out onto the streets preaching the gospel. Miracles were happening in the streets. Germans, Germans getting healed in the streets. Atheists, post-Christian society, people jumping out of wheelchairs in the streets. This is what was happening in Germany. And I learned a big lesson. God is looking for some of us that are just too, we just have enough faith that we didn't know it can't be done. It's time for the evangelist to arise. If you're an evangelist and you've been told that you're strange, let me tell you something. God made you strange for a reason. He made you different for a reason. He gave you audacious faith for a reason. 
It's time to put it to work for the kingdom of God. I'm going to stop now. Can you say amen? amen? How many evangelists are here? I probably should have asked that in the beginning. I might have been talking to a room full of pastors and didn't even know it, in which I would have said something totally different. Just yesterday, we had our very first meeting of the Global Evangelism Alliance. The Global Evangelism Alliance is a gathering of very highly influential um, leaders in evangelism from all over the world. These are men and women that not only have great evangelistic ministries themselves, but in many cases they represent hundreds or even thousands of evangelists that work together with them. For example, um, Youth with a Mission was represented there. Youth with a Mission has 30,000 missionaries all over the world that work with them. They were represented by one of the people there around that table. And we began to strategize. Here is, the, here is the reality that the gift of the evangelist has been neglected in the church for a long time. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I was in Lusaka, Zambia. We were there for a crusade. The very first night, 80,000 people showed up. It, it grew, sometimes doubling every night until the end, one of the top bishops on the platform came up to me. He was about to burst with enthusiasm. He said, he said I wanna tell you something. He said, I've had a revelation this week. He said, I realize that we have been honoring the pastor and we have been honoring the prophet and we have honored the apostles and we have honored the bishops and we have honored the teachers. But he said, we have forgotten about the evangelists. And he said, in this crusade, I have realized something. We need the gift of the evangelist in the church again. You see, here is the reality. A lot of pastors say, well, I'm a pastor. I can preach the gospel as good as any evangelist can, and I can give an altar call. And you know, that's probably true. Most pastors are better preachers than us anyway. And every pastor should know the gospel, so that means every pastor can preach about Jesus and give an altar call. But there's a difference. You see, an evangelist is not just somebody who preaches the gospel. It is a certain breed. We have a certain kind of DNA. We're driven in a certain way for souls. And that is not something that can just be taught. Some things can be taught, but you've heard the saying, other things have to be caught. You can teach what you know, but you can only reproduce what you are. So when a pastor preaches the gospel, people might get saved, but he's going to reproduce other pastors. If you want to see evangelists reproduced, you've got to get evangelists. Evangelists produce more evangelists. That's how this thing works. We replicate ourselves. And I believe what God is doing is he's stirring up the gifting of the evangelist again. Reiner Bonnke told me when he was in Bible school, evangelist is what they called somebody who failed their, their pastoral exams. If you got a good grade, you were a pastor. If you failed, you were an evangelist. I want you to know something. Evangelist is not a second-rate member of the five-fold ministry. We are a part of what God has called for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we come into the fullness of the stature of Jesus. We are a part of that church, and we're needed and we're necessary. And for so long, there has been a vacuum in the church. Evangelists have just been floating. They've been wandering like vagabonds without a home. Many times they're misunderstood. Many times they feel neglected. I had a, a friend of mine who's an evangelist called me a few months ago. He had just had a crusade where hundreds of thousands of people had come. Many thousands had become Christians. He called me. He told me some of the stories. And then I noticed his voice was trembling. He said, you know, I feel so alone. He said, we've just experienced these great things. But he said, I don't even know who to call and talk to about it. My friend, this has to change. The church as a whole, we desperately need the gift of the evangelist. And I believe what God has called us to do is to begin to help one another and encourage one another. And so we've started this alliance in order to bring evangelists into the family, to give them a place where they can network with one another, where they can encourage one another, where they can receive training, where they can receive mentorship, where they can belong to a family, where they can cooperate to do great things for the kingdom of God. Can you imagine a group of evangelists that says, you know what, we have a heart for South Africa this year. And on the same day, we're gonna go to every city in South Africa and we're gonna have a crusade. And we're gonna, we're gonna blitz the nation all in one day. A hundred evangelists, 200 evangelists, all working together towards the same end. Can you imagine what can happen? Nations could be shaken. This is the world that we live in. God is raising this up. And I believe that the, the season that we're living in is the season of the evangelist. So if you're an evangelist, I want to invite you to join us. 
I think you should have received those cards when you came in. Is that true? That, those cards are for those of you that would, are interested in finding out more information about how to become a part of the Global Evangelism Alliance. There are no dues. This is not a business. There is no ulterior motive here. We're not trying to build a mailing list. We're not trying to start a ministry. We all have our own ministries. But what we are trying to do is to create a platform where evangelists can come together, where they can work together, where they can help one another, and where they can become more effective for the sake of the kingdom of God. So if that interests you, I want to invite you to sign up, and we will be sending you more information in the days to come. Amen? God bless you all.